Good evening and welcome everyone. We are thrilled to have you with us at the Power of Passing Investing Meetup. Um, Matt and I are excited to have our presenter for tonight, James Kennedy. Um, before we give James the floor, let me go through our um, usual admin stuff. I'm going to share the screen in a second. Okay. So as I said, we are welcoming um, James Kennedy tonight. James is a real estate CPA. Um, he has a pretty hot topic that he's going to cover, which is depreciation, whether it's your friend or foe. And I'll let him to get into the details of that. But just to give you a couple of words about uh, James, um, he is a successful part-time real estate investor in addition to being CPA and serving tons of investors in New Jersey and beyond. Um, Jim has worked for IRS. Um, he served as a first, first there as a tax examiner, and then he was promoted to a criminal investigator in CID branch of the service. And you guys are welcome to ask him about that experience. Um, he spent 27 years practicing accounting. Before that, he was trained as a French chef and he worked in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut, uh, practicing, uh, I'm guessing both, I'm not sure. We'll, we'll ask James about that. And he also cooked for two presidents and two governors, which is super impressive. So um, James, I'm sure you're gonna get questions about your culinary experience, uh, probably even more than about taxes, but we'll see. Folks, this is our usual disclaimer. This is for educational purposes only. We're not selling anything. So please take it back to your uh, CPA, attorneys, consultants, and review with them prior to making any decisions. As usual, please mute yourself uh, during the presentation. Feel free to post your questions in the chat or ask them later uh, when uh, our presenter finishes his presentation. Uh, our next meetup is gonna be as usual on the first Wednesday of the month at 7 p.m. Eastern, and we will have Matt Faircloth. Um, he is not doing any formal presentation. Instead, he'll allow you to ask him any questions. And for those that don't know Matt, um, he is a real estate syndicator. So uh, multifamily is his main asset of, of syndication. If you have any questions, or if you don't yet, then prepare your questions and come to us. This is gonna be a pretty interactive meetup next time. Uh, we lo love connecting with folks at our meetup. So this is the con contact information for Matt and I. Feel free to reach out to either one of us or both. I will stop my presentation and without any further ado, James, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you, Alina. Good evening, ladies and germs. Broadcasting live tonight from 74 inches above the 1214 building in beautiful downtown Cherry Hill. I am Jim Kennedy, CPA. That's the big presentation opening, just to make sure that you know that this is going to be interesting and exciting, even though only a few of you have your screens on. Um, hopefully, you're listening and watching, and this will be very interesting. As Alina said, um, I am a CPA, I'm a third generation CPA. My wife is an accountant, she has a degree in accounting. We met in college, my teenage daughter works with us part-time. It's really pitiful, but you know what? Numbers are in my blood and that's who I am. You know, you are who you are. And uh, before that, I was a classically trained French chef. Uh, I worked in, um, as Alina mentioned, I worked in uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Connecticut. I also worked in upstate New York. I worked in Chicago. I cooked for President Reagan. I cooked for President Carter. I cooked for Governor Florio. And I cooked for a governor's aide before that. And this is a picture of me in a restaurant in Kingston, New York, over there with my cheesy little prince mustache, which everybody had one in 1986 when that picture was originally taken. After that, I went back to um, college and I worked for the Internal Revenue Service. This is my old IRS badge to prove that I actually did work there. You can see my hair was not gray, so it was about <clears throat> years ago. So. With all that said, my wife and I own and self-manage a series of rental properties across two counties here in beautiful South Jersey. Uh, beautiful South Jersey is, in fact, an oxymoron, in case you didn't know, okay? Oxymoron is two things that are opposite, like jumbo shrimp. So here in beautiful South Jersey, we have about uh, a dozen properties. We actually sold a couple of them this year because the market's so... Spent a decade investing in uh, Texas, 
Uh, also in Houston, where we found that the properties flowed really, really well, but they just didn't appreciate that much. So we made our money back while we held it, as opposed to uh, on the sale, on the back end. We made a little bit, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, my wife and I own and operate a series of residential commercial rentals. There's, uh, we have 11 units with 18 children. I mean, tenants. I mean, children. I mean, tenants. 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 Okay, tenants. And um, we like to live and die by our lease. We make sure we have a good lease. Um, I'm not going to really discuss that much, but I do a significant amount of consulting in real estate. I belong to the South Jersey Real Estate Investors Association. I've spoken dozens and dozens of times there. I've spoken to the Diversified Investors Group, which is DIG, which is also in Pennsylvania the Housing Providers of Philadelphia, the Landlords Association of Wilmington, Delaware. I talk a lot. If you haven't figured it out yet, God saw fit to make me a talker, so I kind of harness that to give you some information. So without further ado on our fanfare, and now that I'm done telling you how great I think I am, let me try to prove it to you. Okay, ready? Here we go. Any questions? Okay, thanks a lot. Say it. Oh, wait, wait. No. Um, we are here to talk, to talk about depreciation, okay? So in order to understand depreciation, first you have to understand depreciation. I spent three years at night teaching tax on a college level. So in order to understand real estate, you've got to understand three things, basis, adjusted basis, and depreciation, okay? Basis. There's much discussion about basis. You hear it all the time, the basis of the property, this basis. Okay, look, in four letters or less, basis means cost. That's it, folks, cost, okay? For example, you buy a building for $100,000. Your basis is $100,000. Wasn't that easy? Now you can drop these terms casually at your next cocktail party. So you're in for $100,000. That's your basis. Now, let's say that you put a roof or you do some electrical work to jazz it up, run new circuits in. It's $2,000. Now you're all in for $102,000. That means your adjusted basis is $102,000. Excuse me. Uh, so your adjusted basis is $102,000. Two things affect your basis, increases to it when you build onto it with permanent attachments and depreciation, which lowers it. So we're gonna stick with that topic for a minute. On $100,000, I've done the math ahead of time, the depreciation, if you round it off, is $3,000. So let's say that you're in for 100,000, you put in two, and in the first year, you take $3,000 depreciation. At the end of the year, what's your adjusted basis? The answer is 99,000, because you're at 100, you put 2,000 in, went down by 3,000 from depreciation, you're at 99. So now let's say you don't do anything in the second year to the building. At the end of the year, you get a $3,000 deduction, lowers your basis to 96,000. So now let's say at the end of the year, somebody offers you $125,000 and you perfectly close on December 31st. So what's your gain? You bought it for 100, you sold it for 125. Is that your gain, 25? No, sorry. The gain is always the difference between the sale price and the adjusted basis. In this case, in this case, our adjusted basis is 96. So from 96 to 125, we have a $29,000 gain. Okay, there's commissions and stuff. I'm just trying to give you the view from 10,000 feet. So you have a $29,000 gain. So you see how depreciation lowered your basis, which increased your gain. So that makes a lot of people think. And I actually thought that when I took tax my first year of college. And I asked Professor Sarkeesian, I said, wait a minute, how about if I just don't take the depreciation? Now my gain is only going to be 25000 And aren't I smart? And I didn't really say that to him. I thought to myself. And he said, well, there's the allowed or allowable rule in which the IRS says you have to recover the depreciation that was allowed or would have been allowed. So if you didn't take it, you're 0 for 2. You lost it, lost the deduction back here, and you get whacked for it on the back end of the sale. So you always take your depreciation. So depreciation seems like it's your friend because you're taking, in our example, it's $3,000 of depreciation. How do we make that work for us? Easy. Divide it by 12 because it's 12 months in a year. 3,000 divided by 12 is 250. So your depreciation expense, you don't really write a check to depreciation. It's a paper expense. We'll get to that in a minute. But you can have up to $250 a month of positive cash flow and pay no tax because your $250 of depreciation is going to offset that, and make it zero. So you're going to do well. That's how you get your money back while you have the property. Okay. Last year we had, um, I think, 11 properties. I was just looking at my tax return. Our Schedule E total rental income taxable was 18,000. 
but I actually had $45,000 of depreciation factored into that. So if you add that back, the actual cash on cash return was $63,000 or about $5,000 a month or about $480 of property positive cash flow that I was having and yet only paying tax on about one third of it, 18 out of 63. So that's the underlying strategy uh, behind depreciation. Um, oh, okay. So now wait a minute, Jim, you told us that depreciation lowers my basis and I pay more tax on the gain. So I'm losing money, aren't I? Well, you are, but you're not because it's not apples and apples. See, when you're writing off your depreciation, you're getting a deduction at whatever hideous incremental rate you're being taxed at, 28%, 31%, 33%, 39%, 39.6 .6 is the highest. So most of you guys are gonna fall in between 28 and 39%. When I sell the property, if I hold it for a year and a day, and if I'm making less than $486,000 a year, my capital gain rate is gonna be 15%. So even if I pay 15% tax now, I got a write off at 28 or 31%. So I'm still ahead of the game, okay? So it's your friend, it's not your friend, you know, it's kind of like bourbon. You gotta know how to handle it, not too much, not too little, or it'll really come back and make your life a mess, all right? That's what I was told anyway. I mean, I would never do something like that. Okay. And now a word from our sponsor. Excuse me. Okay. If everybody's happy with that, I assume. So now you have a basic idea of depreciation, your basis, and your adjusted basis. Now you can show off to your friends at your next cocktail party and casually toss some terminology around. And they'll be like, ooh, he must know Jim Kennedy. Okay. So hopefully they won't hold that against you. So now let's take it a step further. Let's talk about this house that you bought for $100,000, all right? Um, you're gonna depreciate it. Depreciation is nothing more than cost recovery. It's consistent with one of two matching principles that the Internal Revenue Code references. This specific matching code says that you must match income and expense to the period in which they apply. For example, you pay the third quarter water bill on your rental property, hey, you write that off. Why? Well, because it happened this year. Third quarter happened this year. You wrote your insurance check, your cash basis taxpayer. You write that off this year. Why? Because it's a one-year policy. It happened this year, okay? You paid $10 a week to Zillow to rent your property, which really irritates the heck out of me right now. I know that they're doing that. But you write that off because you got the benefit of that in the current year. But the IRS could never say that. You see, when things are easy to understand, IRS remedies the situation by quickly assigning confusing terminology. So they say, instead of saying it happened this year, they say you derive significantly all the benefit of the transaction in the current economic period. I mean, the tax code says why use one word or one syllable when three will suffice. So it happened this year. You with me so far? Everything happened this year, write it off this year. Now, you buy a house for $100,000. Can you write that off this year? Well, no, you can't. Why not? Well, because of any luck at all, the house is going to last the house is gonna last for more than a year. Matter of fact, Congress decided that the house is gonna last for 27 and a half years. And here's the appreciation folks, here's the payoff. So each year you write off one 27 and a half of the basis of the property. Your $100,000, you take that over 27 and a half years. Okay, it's actually 3.64% if you were trying to figure that out. I just happen to know that because that's my job. So that's the whole line, the whole idea of straight line depreciation. You take the same amount, you get your money back. So now, if everybody's okay with that, let's take it another step. Let's think about the house. What did you get with the house? Got a house, okay. What else did you get? Did you get land? Usually, okay. What about land? How long is the land good for? Well, we don't really know because land is land long after we're buried in the land, okay? So when you do your depreciation, from your cost basis, you have to carve out a portion for the land because you can't depreciate that. So as a general rule of thumb, some people use, I go with 15%. I mean, if it's a fancy schmancy place, I might take 20% of it down to shore, I might take 30%. If it's, if it's a condo or if it's in a very bad part of a very bad city, I might take 10% or 5%. Yeah, the idea is carve it out, okay? So from that $100,000 that I was talking about in the house, I have a depreciable basis of $85,000 and it's I think $3,019 a year or something like that. That's how I got that. So 
that's where most people stop. When I was a rookie, when I was growing up in, in accounting, um, I worked for a regional firm, six partners, 68 professionals, 2,000 tax returns. They would say, hit the box, because people drop their stuff off. It goes in the box. You get it. And Gordon was his partner that I would come work for mostly. And Gordon would come to him with a settlement sheet. He would say, look, this guy bought the house for 200000 He's got some closing costs here. He's all in for two twelve. I want you to take 15% out of uh, for land and then just take the rest of the 27 and a half years. Let's get out of here because we've got a lot of work to do. I said, okay, I don't know any better. And many accountants do that. Now, is that wrong? No, no, it's not wrong at all. But I say this, what else came with the house? What was in the house? Was there a sink, a stove, a ceiling fan, a fridge, a garbage disposal, carpeting that's not glued down? Was there kitchen cabinets? Was there, was there um, window treatments? Well, yeah, usually there's some or all of that. So I find that interesting because each of those things that I just mentioned is tangible personal property, or as we call it in business, personal tea. And here's how you remember what it is, because this will be on the final, I'm promising you, okay? You better watch out for this. It might be an essay question. So if you can take it out and not do major structural damage, you have personal tea, okay? Think about that. The fridge, you unplug it, you take it out. The kitchen cabinets, you unbolt them. Hopefully the wall don't fall down, but you can take it out. The carpeting is not glued down, you rip it up, comes out. Tangible personal property. What's the big deal with that, you might ask? Glad you asked that. Yes, that's a good question tonight. Tangible personal property is not good for 27 and a half years. Think about it. Is your carpeting in a rental property really going to last 27 years? I don't think so. Congress says five years. You can take that over five years. So now out of a $100,000 house, let's say we have a washer and a dryer and some carpeting and some this and some that. I mean, you can hit $2,000 accidentally without even trying. So you take that over five years. Now, if you have $2,000 worth of personal tea and you take it over 27 and a half years, that's $72 a year for 27 years. So in five years, you've recaptured $360 of your, dep of your depreciable basis. Do you really wanna do that? Or do you wanna to talk to somebody who's gonna help you write off 100% in the first year, uh, in, in the first five years? Well, hopefully that's me. Anyway. You want to accelerate the depreciation. That is accelerated depreciation right there, folks. But I know a little bit more. Due to some changes in the tax code in 2017, if you have any kind of tangible personal property that has a useful life of 20 years or less, you can write off 100% of that basis in the first year. So that $2,000 worth of five-year property I was just telling you about, boom, you get it off, you get it all back right now. Okay, and wait a minute, your house has a roof, right? Pretty sure it has a roof. A roof is good for 15 years. How much is your roof worth? Five, six, seven thousand dollars. I just put we put a new roof on our house about, um, I guess three or four years ago. Oh no, it was like 11 years ago after the, the big hurricane hit, and it was sixty five hundred dollars. God knows what a roof costs now, seventy five hundred plus twenty five hundred dollars of personal tea. There's a ten thousand dollar write off before you even take the depreciation on your house. That's a lot. Now, the way it sounds interesting, but you know, what's the IRS got to say about all this, you might ask? Another good question you asked, okay? I have a list of 62 things that have been deemed to be tangible personal property. Each one is fully uh, substantiated by a private letter ruling, a revenue ruling, a court case, a, a reg section. I've been through audits with clients, and you know, when they can't find anything, they always like to go to depreciation. Oh, that's a big number for depreciation. Can we see your schedule? Oh, yeah, man, no problem. Here you go. Here's the list. Here's the court cases. Here's the documentation of the basis. How do you like me now, big guy? Helpful hint. Don't really call IRS auditors big guy, okay? They don't like it. Women like it even less, as a matter of fact. I mean, I'm just saying. So this component depreciation, it's here to stay, all right? It was, um, let's see, it was the, the Hospital Corporation of America in 1997 versus the commissioner. That was the breakthrough court case that said component depreciation is here to stay. By the way, component depreciation, cost segregation, accelerated depreciation, all mean the same thing. You use the correct phrase based on who you want to impress. The more impressive, the more syllables. You know, it's up to you. So depreciation matching concept. Okay. All right. So let's see what time it is here. Wow, I still have three minutes. Okay, I put a timer on here because I, I got a runaway mouth. 
So, so the depreciable basis is the amount that you take over the appropriate life of the assets, okay? Now, a lot of people have, are leaning towards Airbnb. Maybe some of you have Airbnbs. Here's the interesting thing about that. I was just talking to a guy today he, uh, in Long Island. I got a new client from Bigger Pockets. I get a lot of business from Bigger Pockets. And he's got this Airbnb out in Brick Township. And I said, well, is it furnished? He goes, oh, yeah. I said, well, tell me what's in it. He goes, you know, bed, coffee table, uh, silverware plates. And I'm thinking, personal tea, personal tea, personal tea, personal tea. Holy mother of pearl. That guy's going to have a boatload of stuff, okay, to write off and get his money back. Now, obviously, accelerated depreciation, this cost seg stuff I'm talking about, it only happens once in the first year, okay? And it'll happen continuously as you make improvements. But the idea here, what we do is we like to get you back all as much as we can in the first year. One last thing, I get a new client. And a matter of fact, I'll tell you about um, Mike. Mike came to me, he had a property, a triplex in Philadelphia. He had it for seven years. And I saw that he had like 25% of it allocated to land and the depreciation schedule. I said, that's kind of nutty. Where's it at? And he told me. And it wasn't like a really, it wasn't a bad area, but it wasn't really a good area. And, you know, it's a row home in South Philly. Excuse me. So I said, you know what? I don't think that the land is worth all that much. You know, instead of 25%, maybe we take 15%. So that was a difference in fit of $1,500 a year in depreciation. This guy had it for seven years. I said, man, we're looking at a $10,500 adjustment. He says, no, we're not. I said, why? He goes, you can only go back and amend your return for three years, right? I said, well, that's right. But if you're like me, you know about Section 481A adjustment using Form 3115. Section 481A says you can take a cumulative adjustment for all the depreciation that you didn't take all the way back to when you bought the property. And it's not limited by the statute of limitations because technically speaking, it's a change in depreciation methodology. Now, this may sound funny, but it's not meant to be funny. You're changing from an improper method of depreciation to a proper method of depreciation. I took a $10,500 adjustment by filing form 3115, an eight-page form, six pages of essay, two pages of computation. Mercifully, I have a lot of CPA paperwork. Uh, CPA means copy and paste again, okay? I have like a Word doc to answer the questions and Excel templates, and we bang this thing out. And it works every, oh, it works every time. Um, and so that's my story about depreciation. I'd like to thank the Academy, and I hope I passed the audition. Alina, back to you. James, not only you pass the audition, but you also get all of the Oscars that we have for tonight. So thank you for doing all that. All of them. <laughs> that's great. Thank you thank so you. much. I'd like to thank my mom and dad. Say hello to my sister in Omaha. Okay. Thank you, Alina. We have some guests from Canada, so please say hello to them as well. <laughs> Jim, this was amazing. Thank you. And thanks for keeping it to, to half an hour time to give folks time to ask questions. So we have some in the chat. Uh, when you were talking about cost segregation, someone, Umar is asking, uh, doesn't it have to be done by a specific company or can just an accountant uh, decide how much to take of that? Please. That's a really good question. And I'd like to thank my sister for asking that. No, 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 I'm kidding. Uh, whoever, if this is somebody. Um, so I've talked about cost seg on a residential basis. On a commercial, it can be done on a commercial basis too. Um, we're, we also do certified audits. We're an audit firm. And I have an audit client that did a million square foot fit out. And I referred him to a professional uh, cost segregation agency. And here's why. In a building, like you and me, there's a ceiling fan, okay? And you, you paid uh, $98 for it. So we're going to write that off. But in a warehouse, there are court cases and the latest and greatest rulings that allow you to take the fan and all the wiring that's attached to the fan that goes from here back to the junction box. So you have a lot more allocated, okay? This guy had a million dollar fillet, excuse me, million dollar fit out, and he had something like $150,000 of five-year property right off the bat. So those people know the latest and greatest court cases, and I don't touch them. But because I have these 62 documented items of tangible personal property, I'm not afraid to do it. I can do it with a reasonable degree of certainty. 
And the, the, the real kicker to, to me standing behind that is I'm too darn old to go back to the restaurant business. Remember the picture of me, I had brown hair. Now I have brown highlights. So it can be done by an accountant, but you have to be able to document it. I tell my clients to go to the internet. You, have, you, have, you checked off dishwasher? Find a dishwasher that looks like yours. A new dishwasher that you found, you just showed me, cost $400. Your dishwasher wasn't new though. So you got to make, uh, make a call. Maybe it's three quarters as good. Maybe it's half as good. So you write that down and you document that right on there. And you put the total on, this to on the summary sheet and off you go. I got a guy in South Carolina who owns uh, a 30 unit complex. He got audited. Depreciation became a fishing trip. The nitwit IRS auditor, and I meant nitwit in the most professional of all possible connotations. He said, you know, the depreciation looks a little high, $76,000 in the first year. I was like, oh yeah. Um, here you go. And I gave him the four sheets. It's only four pieces of paper that showed what, you know, there was 30 of these and 30 of those and 30 sink, 30 film, all that. And he goes, well, I can't really accept this. I said, oh, okay. So I reached into my zipper bag and I pulled out 145 pages of the client's documentation that he did, where he did just that. And I said, here you go. How's this? He goes, oh crap. I'm never going to have time to read all that. I said, pick a couple and look at it. Oh, here, here it is. And I gave it to him as PDFs on a USB drive. So if you document it, anybody can do it, but you got to know the court cases or you got to know the latest revenue rulings. Did I uh, answer the question, Alina? So Jim, essentially, regardless whether it's commercial or residential property, uh, it can be done by an accountant and not necessarily a cost segregation engineer. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. I would... I would never hesitate to refer a commercial one out to a professional company. I actually have a company in Houston that I work with that does it and they do a really good job. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Umar, did it answer thanks. your question? I see your hand is still up. Yeah, thanks, James. Uh, appreciate it. Yeah, it does answer the question. So I guess what you're saying is for residential, for simple tasks, uh, simple projects, you do recommend clients to do it themselves, but they need to do proper documentation. And for complicated commercial stuff, it's better to use a certified company for that. Well, well, I don't recommend clients do it themselves. I mean, under my guidance, yes, but I've only had one person who ever did it themselves. And this was like a real type A button down, uh, over caffeinated lady who did a really good job on it. The year before she came to me for tax services, she's like, I did it myself. How you like me now? I was like, wow. But uh, yeah, under my guidance, I would I would have the, the client do it because, you know, why pay an accountant to do stuff that you can do yourself? If you do all the information gathering, you don't need to pay me for three or four hours of looking up sinks and stoves and ceiling fans and fridges and all that. You know, we want to spend um, our time and your money doing higher level stuff. So if I can empower clients to do that kind of stuff, well, they're good for me and the, pay, the savings get passed on to you. Got it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Next question, Jim, is from Chris. How is depreciation shared across syndication investments? I have no idea. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, each property, as far as I understand, that's a really good question. Depreciation of syndication. Could, could I get a little more clarification on, on the question uh, from the asker? Chris, you want to clarify? Sure, yes. I'm sorry. I'm... Uh in the middle of cooking dinner while uh, Jim is, uh, is, uh, is uh, presenting and I'm listening. But um, the, the question is really focused on, uh, you know, when, when uh, a passive investor uh, invests in a real estate syndication, um, the, the cost segregation and the depreciation um, of that cost segregation is shared across the, the various different passive investors. And so my question is related to how is that broken down? Is it equally distributed? Is it distributed based on the, uh, the amount um, that that passive investor? Uh -huh. Okay. That type, that's my question. Uh, and that's a, thank you for um, uh, taking a minute away from dinner uh, to clarify that. The depreciation is a part, it's a line item, of the profit and loss statement, okay? And it's all of your income comes through on a pro rata share. Whatever you invest in a syndication, if you own 2%, you're gonna get 2% of the bottom line, the rental income minus the operating expenses, minus the depreciation expenses. Here comes the bottom number. 
you know, it's, I don't know, it's, it's a thousand dollars and you own 2%. So you get 2%, whatever that is. And that comes through right on your K1. Chris, did it answer your question? It does. Thank you very much, Jim. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, let me just say a word about syndications. Um, Alina, I think you said Matt Faircloth is coming in next week. He, yeah. Do you know him? Yeah. Matt came to me when I, uh, I guess it was about 2007 or so. Matt had done a 1031 and I'm not giving away, I'm not going to mention details or anything, but one of the interesting things about 1031s uh, is that not, you know, they're recognized on a federal level, but only 44 states recognize them. And Matt's transaction took place in Pennsylvania. And Matt came in, he had all his books and records documented. He had a great set of records. You know, he just can't go out here. You specialize in this stuff here. I got this. So how do I defer the gain on the federal side and on the Pennsylvania side? I'm like, well, on the federal side, it's a snap. We simply blah, 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 blah. And he goes, how about the other side? So, Pencil <clears throat> Matt, did you know that there's only 44 states? And Matt was, he was, he wasn't real thrilled to hear that. Uh, but we, we got through it and Pennsylvania has a flat tax of it was 3.01%, I think back then. And uh, we lived to tell about it and it could have been worse, but Matt will be a great guest. Uh, I bump into Matt periodically, uh, professionally and actually personally, because he doesn't live far from me. So he'll, he'll do a great job as he always does, Alina. He, he is, yes, he's, he's very um, engaging for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Guys, any other questions that, oh, I see more questions. So a uh, question from Suk. Do you have any general advice for people that are not real estate professional? My CPA indicated that she cannot write off rental losses as she does for people that are in real estate sector full time. Okay, that's actually a very good topic. What, what the asker of that question is asking about uh, by name is passive activity loss limitations. Here's how that works. Uh, when you're a real estate professional under code section 469, that's all you're doing, okay? Just like it was a business, like it was my accounting firm, okay? So if you have losses, you deduct those losses because everything you have is at risk. But if you have a day job like me and you've got a fistful of properties you're renting over here, that's different. They're passive activities. That's extra fun because we all know, as the IRS accurately states, that what real estate investors don't really do anything. We just sit back and the money just comes rolling in. You know, that's why it's passive activity. Here comes the check. You know, I'm spending a lot of money driving to the bank to cash these checks. And you have a day job. So the government says, okay, so you're married. All right. So when your income goes over $100,000 or anybody's income, married, single, et cetera, the government says, I have to check on that. When your income goes over $100,000, the government says, congratulations, you're rich. And because you're rich, you don't need those passive activity losses as much as some poor small making less than 100,000. So as your income goes from 100,000 to 150,000, your adjusted gross income, the allowable loss goes down from 25,000 down to zero. So if you're, if, if you make 80,000, if you make 90,000, then your, your wife or significant other makes 70,000, you guys have $160,000 of AGI. Any rental losses you have, you won't be able to take. Now, you don't lose them, okay? They get suspended and they kind of wait over there until one or two things happens, until either your AGI, your just gross income drops below a buck and a half, 150K, or excuse me, when you sell the property, all the suspended losses come through. Uh, good example, I have a client who is an extremely successful builder. He works for a building company, travels the country, works a ton, makes like, W2 is like, $700,000, okay? And he has a rental property in Ventnor. Now, for those of you who don't know, Ventnor are high-end wage earners. All the houses there started a half a million. So he sold this house and he made, it was like $400,000 profit, or something like that. And he's like, I'm going to get hammered, Jim. I was like, no, you're not, dude. He goes, why? I said, well, because you had this house for seven years. You got close to $600,000 of um, suspended losses. And sure enough, they all came through and they offset the gain and it wiped out a lot of his taxable income and he had withholding. And the guy ended up getting a $65,000 refund, which uh, should hit the bank tomorrow, the 4th of November. So the suspended losses come back. So coming back to the question, um, see if I can summarize this. 
passive activity losses. If you work and have a day job, if your income goes over 100,000 up to 150, your losses phase out and wait until your income drops or you sell the property. If you're a full-time real estate investor, then you get all your losses because that's all you're doing. That's all you're doing, period, there. Thank you, James. Um, yeah, I think you answered the question. Kind of follow up to that. So if you have this carry forward passive losses that you haven't been able to use, can you only use them to offset passive gains from real estate or can you offset other things? You can offset other things also. Uh, for example, let's say that um, I have my rental properties and let's say that my buddy approaches me with an idea. He's gonna um, start flipping businesses, okay? And he's trying to raise capital. So I put $100,000 in and he promises me interest and blah, blah, blah. Okay. And the first year it loses money because of depreciation. Uh, no, it makes money. Okay. So it comes out $10,000 ahead, but it's passive activity. Passive losses offset passive gains. So my real estate loss can offset my passive activity investment income. And they can be netted out because they're all on Schedule E, which is where all your passive activity um, is reported. Some of it on page one if it's rental, some of it on page two if it's a K-1 from a, some kind of passive investment. The thing you got to watch out for is if you have a self-directed IRA, okay, and you invest in limited partnerships like energy partnerships, you're going to pay a boatload of tax because limited partnerships generate what's called unrelated business income tax, UBIT, which is extremely, extremely difficult. For example, my sister-in-law, my wonderful sister-in-law, she doesn't like to take, she listens to my advice very carefully. She takes notes and then she does whatever she wants. So, so she got dinged for $22,000 of uh, taxes here because her IRA invested in some limited energy partnerships. And she's like, she comes to me, I don't do her 5,500, the tax return for the self record IRA, but she comes to me, she goes, look at this notice. This tax return says I owe $22,000. Is that right? It's like, mm, yeah. So be very careful what you do with your self-directed IRA, period. Alina? Thank you, Jim. So essentially what you're saying is if you are an owner or a partner in a business and you sell it, that is active business. But if you are, have passively invested in a business that's been sold with a gain, that can offset your passive real estate losses. That's right. And we don't need to get into it, but there are rules as to what makes a passive investor a passive investor. Basically, I have no control over any of the day-to-day -day operations. I don't have any voting rights. I don't have the right to anything, as a matter of fact, except to sign my life away. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you, James. Hey, you're welcome. Uh, next question. If we haven't done segregation on real estate property bought years ago, can we still do it anytime now or in the future? The answer is yes and yes. You can, you can file a form 3115. And, well, wait a minute, let me cl clarify my remarks. As long as you still have the original stove from seven years ago, yes. If you still have the original carpeting from seven years ago, yes. But if you replace the stove, then no, because you don't have it anymore. Um, but if you have that stove and you're taking it over five years and it was only three years ago, then yes. It's a little bit of a, a calendar mathematical equation, uh, but to, to get more focused on the asker's the listener's question, yes, there is no time limitation on uh, changes in accounting methodology to take cost segregation. That's, that's the whole idea behind Form 3115. It's not like where you only have three years to amend. As I mentioned, you're changing your depreciation method. It's a change in accounting method. Change in accounting method is a pretty serious thing. Uh, more commonly, it's uh, you change from cash to accrual or construction companies will change a different method. There's a couple of different methods that they can use. It's, you know, and, and it, it really manipulates your income in those, in those kind of things. And it has a pretty material impact here. So the IRS takes this pretty serious. Matter of fact, the change in accounting methodology form, Form 3115, is the only form out of the jillion forms that you have that has to be filed twice. Once with the Internal Revenue Service when you attach it to their regularly filed return. And you also have to send it to a special branch of 
uh, IRS attorneys in Washington, D.C. You, you um, see, you, you, uh, you fax it, because I did four of them this year, and I faxed each one of them to Washington. Never heard back from them. Don't know why. I don't ask why, though. I just do my job and, uh, you know, go home. So, Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, essentially what you're saying is um, if you have replaced certain parts uh, of the house, a stove, maybe a uh, carpeting, then you can only do cost seg on, on the rest of the house, on the parts that you have not touched. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. With the, the slightly confusing um, addition that if you have property that's not fully depreciated, that you could have taken 100%. You can throw that into the cost seg too, but you had to have had to do any of this. You had to have had it in service for at least two years. If it's more than two years, if it's one year old or two years old, you go back and amend the returns. But if it's more than two, now that comes into play. And one of the things that we always do is we kind of do a little back of the envelope cost benefit analysis. I mean, if it's going to, if it's going to cost you this much for me to do this thing and you're going to get this much back, that's good. Okay. But if it's going to cost you this much for me to do it and you get back that much, I'm not going to do it. It's probably unethical. So I can try to steer clear of that. Got it. Thank you. Makes sense. You're welcome. Next question. Can you validate that this is true? Uh, LP in a multifamily syndicate, as an LP in the syndication, I can defer when I take the depreciation for future years. Is there any limitation such as you have to take depreciation before the property is sold or within five years? I'm making the latter two conditions up. Okay. Um, you have to take depreciation in the year it's taken. All right. If you don't, then you have two choices. You can take a catch up, um, a catch up adjustment using form 3115 for all the depreciation that was never taken or you're gonna get whacked on the back end when you sell the property. The, um, the, the uh, matching code that I mentioned before says you have to take income and expense on the period in which they are incurred. So deferring it is not really gonna help, especially um, in tax planning where you're always trying to accelerate your depreciation. You constantly wanna build up those losses if, if they're being suspended or if they're sitting in a partnership because well, quite frankly, you never know what's gonna happen. I mean. I'm minding my own business and I get a phone call and this guy calls me out of the blue and says, do you own this property at so-and-so address? Yeah. And well, we're interested in buying it. And all of a sudden, when push comes to shove, I get a sweet offer. Um, and so- All right. Well, maybe, let me see if I'm, I'm doing maybe Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm, I have the other one. Uh, Umar, I yeah, think I mean, you're- uh, positive, Is that not... Umar? Yeah. That was Umar. Okay, Sorry, good. Um, cause suddenly I got an offer and luckily I had depreciated the property. So I'm not going to get beat up on the back end. So yeah, take it as soon as possible. I can't really think of any reason to defer it. Yeah. It, Jim, uh, it was a long question and, uh, Sug is asking, can you defer depreciation as an LP? So I want to clarify if you're LP in a syndication, you get a K1 stating how much depreciation you're given. So you are not in a position to defer it, you're limited oh. partner. So you, you're given something, you take it. You cannot say, no, I'm not going to take it. it. It passes through to your own personal tax return, essentially. I'm sorry. You're, you're exactly right. I missed that point. In it, was, it was a long question. So yeah. It, it, in in limited that. partnership, you don't get to do anything except put money in. And here's your K-1 at the end of the year. So you can't defer it. You know, your K-1 comes from the people that, the, from the syndication itself. You can't make any adjustments because that K-1 goes to the IRS and it gets matched up. Every federal document that you get gets matched up by the IRS. When I first went there, I was a tax examiner. And what happens is it was in the, the late 90s when I worked for the IRS and they had people who were data input people and they did like 20,000 keystrokes an hour and they just put stuff in. All right, They put all the stuff in. And then it goes through the pipeline and if everything matches what the IRS has, it's done. But if there's a difference, it comes up on an examiner's screen. And that's what I did. I did correspondence audit. If it shows, um, if it shows a rental loss of $1,000 and the taxpayer reports $1,000, that's fine. But if it's $1,000 uh, from the company and the, um, the taxpayer decides it's actually zero, there's a difference there. And now my job was to input a code which spits out a letter 
and it says, you know, you miss this, you owe this much, and so on and so on. Everything that goes gets matched up. Any federal tax document you get, any W-2, any K-1, any 1099, and there's like 36 different types of 1099s or 1098, it all matches up. So you always wanna make sure you match that, and that includes your K-1. I've only seen a K-1 get adjusted one time, and that was by a CPA, a guy I went to high school with, who had a big argument with the firm when they bought him out, and he decided it was different. So he attached several pages of calculation, da, 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 and he did it, no problem. That's one time out of a jillion tax returns that I've seen. So no, he doesn't, he doesn't have a leg to stand on, I'm sorry. Thank you, James. So on, sure. the, other, on the other hand, uh, GPs in the syndications get to determine together with the CPA as to whether they wanna do cost segregation. Depreciation is a given, but cost seg is something that they have to decide as you explained earlier. That's exactly right, because they're the general partners. They're the ones that are gonna be in a lot of trouble if there's any kind of uh, action from the IRS, because A, they're gonna get in trouble with the IRS. B, all the limited partners are gonna be pretty frowning faced about having an assessment leveled against them. Thank you. So there- I think I need to restate my question. I just realized I may have been incorrect. Can you take the losses in the future years, not the depreciation, but the actual losses? Can that be deferred? Uh, not on your personal return when you're in a limited yeah. partnership? Uh, mm -hmm. No. You might okay. have to if your income is limited because you made more than 150000 yeah. but it's not really a choice that you have, ma'am. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Suka, so you're asking if you can carry your losses forward, if you cannot take them. Yeah, you can carry them forward, absolutely. Oh. Okay, great. If you have passive gains to offset your passive loss, I mean, then you have set them in a year. But if you have no passive gains that can be offset by your passive losses, then they carry it forward into the future indefinitely. Jim, correct me if I'm wrong. You're not wrong. That's exactly right. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anytime. Guys, any other questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and just ask your question. Whoever is not uh, cooking dinner or if the dinner is ready, feel free to unmute and ask them. Not everybody at once, it's very confusing. Absolutely. Uh, I, I would like to add, Elena, that um, you should keep an eye on this, talk to a tax professional, even if it's not me, because one of the jobs of Congress, or not job, but one of the things that con Congress is actually who writes the tax laws. Congress goes back and forth, you know, I'm not going to say that the president is good or bad, okay? I don't do that. But I will go to political stereotypes. Republicans have been known to f favor high-end wage earners. Democrats have been known to favor blue-collar people who are not making as much. And so every time you get an administration, you get a new tax code rewrite because that elected official wants to accommodate his constituents because they voted for him. And so there's always tax changes. There's tax changes because of political reform and also sometimes because of the economy, Congress will manipulate the tax code to its advantage. A couple of good examples of that are, was the stimulus check that came out when the pandemic hit the fan. Uh, that was getting money into people's hands. They made more changes this year with the child tax credit. All oh, that's outside of real estate, but excuse me, uh, accelerated depreciation got a real shot in the arm about 20 years ago when they came up with accelerated depreciation instead of like, a piece of five-year furniture or something being five years straight line, they have this fancy schmancy formula whereby you get over 80% of the depreciation in the first three years. The idea is manufacturers who buy six, seven, eight, nine figures worth of heavy duty machinery, after three years, they've gotten most of the depreciation. So now they have to buy more. And so that stimulates the economy because they buy more. So always keep one ear uh, on what's happening uh, especially now, because there's been a couple of big changes in the, um, as a result of the elections. I live in New Jersey, and they still haven't figured out who won yet. We had a Democrat, and now the Republican has been very, very close. They've been neck and neck, and I heard Virginia flipped also, and that went from one party to another. So you might watch for that. But during the last presidency, President Trump made some very significant um, changes to real estate, uh, because he has a lot of real estate. And so just keep an ear out for that. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, You're welcome. Very helpful. Uh, Jim, for the folks that want to reach out to you, do you want to put out your phone number, email, website, anything? Yes. Um, 
you can call my office. This is the very phone that I'll talk to you from, just in case you were wondering. That phone number is 856-662-5555. Yeah, that's right, 5555. I had needed a number that I could keep in my little pea brain and not forget, 856-56, uh, yeah, right, see? 856-662-5555. I will tell you that in my imperial cheapness, I don't have a secretary because every phone calls from me. So I check my voicemail regularly every day or two. However, my email is always on in the background. It's always there. It's like a second wife, okay? But it doesn't cook for me. So my email address is my name and my job, jameskennedy.cpa at verizon.net. That's J-A-M-E-S-K-E-N-N-E-D-Y dot, oh, no, dot C-P-A at verizon.net. That's how you can get a hold of me. Thank you, Alina, for allowing me to get a shameless plug-in uh, for Kennedy and Associates located conveniently at 1214 Chambers Avenue in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Uh, and as a matter of fact, we, we actually don't see anybody in the office. Um, due to some very severe illnesses in my family, we closed the office when the uh, pandemic hit. And uh, most of my employees, um, work remotely. I have one guy who comes in for 20 hours, but it's just me. You know, for 27 years, tax season went like this. Oh man, I got tomato sauce on my favorite tie. This year it was like, oh man, I got tomato sauce on my favorite sweatshirt. <laughs> so this is not like the fifth time I put a tie on this year. Um, so there you go. I saw another question, Alina. Yeah, when is the best time to bring CPA into the deal? Before, 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 the five P's that the Marines teach us prior planning prevents poor performance. I would like to think that I'm a pretty good accountant, but once December 31st passes, I do terrible on that whole time travel thing. I can't go back. Prior planning prevents poor performance. If you look at a deal beforehand on the sell side, then you can begin to determine what the tax ramifications will be. You can develop some expectations. You can manage those expectations. For example, I sold two rental properties this year. I've walked away with over $300,000, okay? And most of that's gonna be profit too. That's gonna to stink, all right? So I thought about that and I talked about it with my wife and we decided to set up a special kind of pension plan for my business called a defined benefit plan where I can put away almost $300,000 for my pension because I'm over 60, my wife is 60. Don't tell her I told you that by the way, okay? Uh, well, she's home right now, so it's okay. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have, I'm going to use round numbers. I'm going to have a $300,000 gain on Jim Kennedy's tax return. My business, because it's an S corporation, I take all the money out in salary. And then I make this $300,000 deduction. So I have a $300,000 loss that flows through to my tax return. So I got a $300,000 gain. I got a $300,000 loss, zeros out. No, no, no tax ramifications at all just my W-2 with the withholding against it. And that way uh, I'll come out, you know, get a little bit back, pro probably. I try not to pay a little bit back, but I always get a little bit back. So that's prior planning prevents poor performance. Always talk to me before, or a CPA beforehand. Also on the way in, okay, before you buy a property, I have people call me up and say, hey, Jim, man, I got this situation going on. Here's the deal. What do you think, deal or no deal? I got a couple simple ratios that I use. The 1% rule are the rents 1% of the purchase price. I use a gross rent multiplier. You know, it takes about seven or eight seconds to figure out. And then, you know, you look at the area, you know, make sure you don't have the curse, which is having the nicest house on the block because everybody else's dump brings, your down, brings yours down. And, you know, based on my 15, 16 years as a real estate investor, I give my opinion on that too. Ultimately, clients make their own decision because I'm not their husband or father or brother, I'm just a CPA. I provide them with options and then they can make their own decision. Thank you, Jim. You're welcome. Uh, Jim, question unrelated to real estate, but I hear it from folks sometimes. Uh, how can someone decide whether they should keep a regular array if they have one or whether they should do a backdoor Roth conversion? What was the first part of that? If they should keep their what or do a backdoor? regular array or uh, convert it into Roth, do a backdoor Roth conversion. Okay, okay. Yeah, so doing a backdoor Roth is a great thing. If you make more than a certain amount, 
you can't deduct your Roth. That means you don't get a deduction, so you have basis in it. So then if you turn around and you dump it in, if you convert it into a Roth IRA, well, you have to pay the tax on it. Well, the tax on the $6,000 you put away is some number, but you have basis, so it comes down to zero. So you can take that and move it over into a Roth and then pay no tax on it, blah, 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 blah. When is that? The question was, when, when is it a good time to do that, Alina? Did I get that right? Yeah. Okay. The best time to do it is absolutely, the answer is two words. It depends. How was the rest of your income and how much are you converting? If you made, you know, if you made seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 this year, you have to look and see what the, what the tax might be, okay? Uh, or what the situation is, um, if you're allowed to. Okay, if you're if you're making below the threshold, which for a married couple I think is two hundred and four thousand or something, hundred twenty nine. I have to look it up. But if you're you want to make sure you're over the limit so that you can keep your basis. If you're only making fifty thousand a year, then and you put away six thousand dollars, when you take it out, you're going to have six thousand dollars of taxable income. So is that bad? I don't know. What's your incremental tax rate? Maybe you sold a property and you had a big loss this year. Or maybe you had something that brought your income way down where the tax bite isn't so bad, okay? Maybe you're going to be in a higher tax bracket later on in your life. There's an interesting thought. People say, well, Jim, I'm going to be retired. I'll be making less money. So I'll be, have less tax then. Well, that sounds great, except for one thing. Since 1961, except for one year, every year, tax rates have inched up a little bit. So you may be making less money, but who knows if your tax rate's not going to be higher. So let's look at right now and see what the tax potential is. So the answer is it's on a case by case basis, only and it depends on the unique uh, facts and circumstances of the individual. Excellent. Thank you, Jim. You're welcome. Guys, any final questions before we adjourn? Oh, I have one, Alina. Go ahead. Uh, how will I be able to see a copy of this so I can show my wife to prove that I actually did this tonight and I wasn't just hanging out with the boys? Yeah, absolutely. I will send you a copy of the recording. Please oh, remember, it, it does include your comment about how old your wife is, so she will hear that comment. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I'm so grateful. Thank you from the bottom of my marriage. But I am happily married, though. I know I am because my wife told me I am. That's, that's excellent. Jim, this has been uh, an impressive presentation, certainly very entertaining. We only Thank expected you. a CPA, but we got a CPA and a stand-up stand comedian and a former chef in one place and a former IRS agent. So um, it, you, you definitely uh, made the you know top, top 100 list for us, for sure. And again, thank you for answering all the questions and sharing sure. your depreciation. Um, presentation with us tonight. Folks, feel free to reach out to Jim. His information is posted in the chat. And yes, once the recording is available, I will share with everyone who uh, registered for the session. Thank you for the opportunity, Alina. I appreciate it very, very much. Pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Good night, okay. folks. Thank you, Jim. Right. You're welcome. Thank you. Good night. Good night.